Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us and uh, taking the time out today to hear uh, today's webinar, which we hope will be very exciting and interesting to you. This is going to be updates from the new DOPS practice monitor, peritoneal dialysis, and really following the pulse of US peritoneal dialysis care. My name is Jeffrey Pearl, an associate professor of medicine at University of Toronto and a staff nephrologist at St. Michael's Hospital. And please follow me at PD Pearls and uh, at DOP Study. Next slide. So I think today's webinar is really important in the context of the exciting times that home dialysis is having here in the United States with the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative um, being signed in 2019. Really that executive order set a precedent for 80% of new patients receiving kidney replacement therapy to either be receiving home dialysis or kidney transplantation by 2025. So that's a very daunting task compared to the uh, uh, really low, lower prevalent of PD utilization and home dialysis utilization currently right now. And as you can see here from the slide, there's going to be differences in payment models that will be introduced all in the hopes of developing strategies to increase the use of home dialysis in the United States. And so with that in mind, we are going to talk about some up-to-date information on peritoneal dialysis care and look forward to an exciting webinar today. Uh, I just want to point out the DOPS has been funded uh, in terms of a partnership um, by uh, uh, industry as well as public funding sponsors, which we're grateful for. And funding for PDOPS and specifically in the DOPS practice monitor for peritoneal dialysis um, is supported in part by Baxter Healthcare without restrictions on publications. So with regards to OPIS, uh, the Optimizing per Prevention of Peritoneal Dialysis Associated Peritonitis in the US, um, it is uh, really a team effort and we want to thank our collaborators here which include um, dialysis organizations, as you can see in this OPUS pilot study, and support for OPUS is from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality via a grant. So today we have an exciting lineup of speakers. Um, Dr. Jenny Shen is a health services researcher and nephrologist at a safety net hospital at Harbor UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles, and will be initially speaking to us um, about the DOPS practice monitor. A patient's perspective is going to be really critical here, and we thank uh, Derek Forfang, who's uh, a pillar in, in the uh, advocacy community uh, with regards to advocating for kidney disease patients, and we're really uh, very fortunate to have his perspective today. And across the pond uh, from the UK, uh, a really successful researcher uh, at, uh, uh, in the UK and a UK co-investigator in PDOPS, Dr. Mark Lambie will share some insights from an international perspective on clinical outcomes associated with use of icodextrin. So the, uh, just to give you guys a sense of the agenda today, Dr. Jenny Shen will kick things off with an update uh, and uh, a tour of the DOPS practice monitor on peritoneal dialysis, followed by a patient perspective from Derek uh, Mark will speak about uh, icodextra and clinical uh, utility, and I'll end things off with some highlights from our OPUS study, and we look forward to some exciting discussion and Q&A with all presenters at the end of the webinar. Next slide. So I just want to remind you some housekeeping rule uh, issues. There's a Q&A feature um, via the chat, and you know, please submit questions throughout as you think about them as the webinar is taking place, and we'll do our best to address all the questions uh, via the chat or audio at the end in the panel via the discussion time that we'll have at the end. Next slide. All right, so we're going to kick things off with a poll um, and just to get the, get everybody sort of interested and uh, engaged about this. So here's poll question number one and we'll come back to the answers at the end of the webinar. All of the following are International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis recommendations for the prevention of PD peritonitis except antibiotics at the time of PD catheter insertion, application of topical antimicrobial cream to the exit site, use of antifungals during prolonged courses of antibiotics, and a, and a consecutive training time of, a, of at least five days, four hours per day. 
So just uh, choose your answer and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the answers at the end. And then the next poll question, what barriers to icodextrin use have you encountered? And you can choose all that apply. So none, paperwork, uh, patient preference, uh, who don't want to have a long dwell, physician preference, and other. So just take a few moments to answer that. And once you've finished answering that, we'll move straight to the presentations. So uh, I hope you find them informative and interesting and looking forward to the chat and discussion and questions at the end. Hi, thank you so much for joining our presentation on the DPM Goes Home insights into real-time PD care. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the Dobbs Practice Monitor PD or DPM PD. So the DPM PD is based on data drawn from PDOPS. And what is PDOPS? It's a multinational initiative to collect data on patients on PD to learn more about PD practice patterns. And the DPM PD is the latest project launched by PDOPS to help bring these data to everyone. The DPN objectives are as follows, to report nationally representative data for US adult PD patients and facilities, to provide unique and timely insights into US PD practice, and to be a resource to assess effects of new policies and latest research findings. So it's important to know what clinical practice trends are looking like in PD, and why is that? Well, there are over 800,000 individuals in the US who receive dialysis or have a kidney transplant. And more than 62,000 of these patients are dialyzing at home with PD. And the PD population is actually only expected to increase. Now, PDOPS draws its data from 150 US PD facilities and includes more than 4,000 PD patients in the US. These information are particularly important in the context of the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. This is a national US initiative to have at least 80% of patients with kidney failure in 2025 to be either on home dialysis or to be transplanted. The DPMPD is a web-based report of up-to-date trends in clinical care of US PD patients. These reports include clinical practice and PD prescription data and they include more than 500 charts, figures, and data tables. And we'll be looking at these a little bit later in the presentation. The DPMPD data are updated every six months to reflect the most recent changes in US clinical PD practices, which might be due to payment or policy updates, availability of new products, or other reasons. In terms of the DPMPD sample and methods, there are about 4,000 adult PD uh, patients in the US that are included in this sample. And they come from about 137 facilities. And these facilities are all across the United States. And they include uh, large dialysis organizations like DeVita and Fresenius, but they also include small and medium chain facilities that utilize the VisionX um, EHR or electronic health records. Um, we do use sampling weights, which means uh, we do weight the data depending on the dialysis organization's size and the geographic region that the facility is in. And in this way, when we report the data out, they're representative of the, at the national level of what the national data should look like. Um, it's not skewed in terms of how um, our individual facilities are skewed. So let's actually take a look at this website. If you go to www.dops.org um, forward slash DPM dash PD here, this is the page that you'll land on. And in the top right here, you're gonna see it says PD. This is actually a drop down menu and you can choose PD or HD. And that's because there is actually a DOPS practice monitor for hemodialysis uh, that has been around even uh, longer than the PD one. And so you can actually toggle and play with that uh, drop down menu to compare data between PD and HD uh, populations. Now you look on this first tab here under browse all data, and then you can go ahead and click on whether you want to filter by clinical topic or by facility or patient characteristic. So let's say you wanted to filter by clinical topic. 
Well, then you can see that you can choose from a number of different um, categories, and this includes demographics, uh, diabetes or cardiovascular, anemia, um, and so on. Now, over here, if you had clicked on the tab over here that says um, about DPMPD, this basically reviews the data that we talked about before um, in terms of um, where the data are coming from and the facilities and so on. Now let's go back um, again to browse all data. And let's say we decided to filter by clinical topic and we chose the category of demographics. Well, then you'll see in uh, area three here, there's gonna be a number of graphics that end up dropping down. And so demographics, let's say, for example, we want to look at age and categories and we click on nationwide. So what does this give us? This basically gives us um, the breakdown of the age distribution in um, the nation, basically, um, who are on PD in this certain period of time. And the period of time here would be from April 2019 to August 2021. And, you're, and you see that it's basically been spread out in four, uh, four month periods. So for example, you can see here uh, that over time, the average age of PD patients may have gone down somewhat and that's because if you look here in the dark blue, um, you can see this is the percent of patients who are more than 75 years uh, old. It's a little uh, hard to see on the screen because it's so small, but this percentage has shrunk, which basically shows that um, the oldest segment of the population on PD has shrunk. Um, so again, that means that over time from 2019 to 2021, um, the age of uh, PD patients has gone up slightly. Um, you can also look at demographics by race. And so here you can see that in terms of PD, um, it's been pretty much steady about maybe like uh, 20 to 25% of PD patients um, have been um, black. It looks like maybe in the last two years that's gone down slightly. Now, if you compare that with the data from DPMHD, um, you can see um, that compared with the HD population, the population of patients on PD who are Black is definitely far lower um, than that that you see in hemodialysis. And this is consistent uh, with the literature that has shown that Black patients are less likely to use PD than white patients. Now, if we take a look at diabetes as a cause of ESRD, you'll see that about 45% of these patients on PD um, have diabetes as the cause of end-stage renal disease. And that's actually gone up slightly in um, the last two time periods that we've collected here in uh, 2021. And you can see that um, you compare it to the cause of diabetes, um, sorry, diabetes is a cause of ESRD in the hemodialysis population. Um, and it's uh, definitely lower in this PD cohort than in the hemodialysis cohort. So what if we look at time with end-stage kidney disease? Um, when you look at it, um, it's a little difficult to appreciate um, on the scale, um, but as PD has grown, the time on ESKD has slightly shifted down. And so uh, the zero to three months, this light blue area here has gotten slightly higher. And this dark blue area of more than four years has um, gotten somewhat smaller. Um, so really, as PD has grown, the time on ESQD has slightly shifted down. Um, this might represent more incident patients starting on PD. Now we're looking at trends in systolic blood pressure. Again, the trends in PD patients have stayed pretty much steady. You can see that the average systolic blood pressure in PD patients has been around 140. And this is definitely a bit lower than the average systolic blood pressures you see in the HD side, um, which are definitely trending higher than 140. As you look at some trends in mineral bone disorder, the distribution of lab values hasn't really changed a whole lot here. Um, and, but you can see that it's notable that about 20% of patients do have a PTH more than 600, which is quite high. Um, but it is comparable um, to the HD population, where we also see um, about a quarter of patients uh, with these very high PTH levels. 
Now, uh, a note about stratifications. You can also take a look at these data stratified by facility size. And when you break it down there, you can look at data by uh, facilities that have less than 20 patients. So we have 47 of these facilities. The size of these facilities range from four patients up to 19. It only represents 13% uh, of the total patients um, in our data sample. And this is opposed to the facilities that have more than 20 patients, I'm sorry, 20 or more patients. We have 104 of these facilities and collectively they represent 87% of the patients um, in our cohort. You can also stratify by black race and also by time on PD. And when you do on time on PD, you can split it up by those patients who have been on PD for less than six months. That's only about 16% of patients in the sample uh, versus more than six months. And that's the uh, vast majority of the patients. So let's take a look. If we had look at these categories, but we went ahead and took a step forward to stratify by, for example, race. So you can see here, we're looking at the same data, same PTH data, but now we're breaking it down by race. So now we can look at strictly what were the black patients um, in the PD population? What were their PTH trends looking like versus the non-black population? And so when you break it down this way, you can see that it's pretty clear that black patients um, definitely have higher PTH levels uh, than the non-black patients. You see this dark blue of more than 600, um, and that bar is definitely much bigger in the black population than in the non-black population. Now let's say we want to stratify by facility size. So let's look at PTH uh, trends there. If you look at facilities with less than 20 patients, you know, their PTH levels might be um, a smidgen lower. You know, this, this blue bars here might be a little bit um, smaller than the blue bars over here. Um, and the trends over time have been pretty consistent. And let's say we want to stratify by time on PD. So you look at patients who have been on PD for less than six months. Not surprisingly, their PTH levels are um, going to be on average lower than those that we see in PD patients who have been on PD for at least six months. Um, and again, you can see maybe the trends themselves haven't changed very much, um, but just overall, those uh, patients who have been on PD for less time, they tend to have lower PTH levels. Now, let's take a look at anemia. Um, and again, if you look here, the trends in hemoglobin, average hemoglobin, haven't really changed very much over time. You have about 20% of patients with a hemoglobin um, less than 10, um, and that's represented here with the yellow um, and, the, and the light blue here. Um, and then about 20% of them have hemoglobins more than 12. So you can see this is um, the combination of this gray and the green up here. Um, but the overall hemoglobin levels do look to be um, on average a bit lower than those seen in hemodialysis. If we take a deeper dive into the anemia data, data and we look at the um, EPO use or ESA use, um, you can see that the EPO use hasn't really changed very much. You can see it's pretty much been um, a little bit under 80% of patients uh, using uh, ESAs, um, but it's definitely markedly lower than the ESA use you see in the hemodialysis patients, which is more in the order of 90%. Now let's look at ferritin. Um, you know, ferritin levels, you might say they may have slightly trended up, because if you look here at this green here, which represents ferritin levels more than 1,200, um, that's quite high. Um, almost 20% of uh, the PD population had these high ferritin levels, and it looks like that green bar maybe is getting a little bit bigger over time. Um, now, this is similar to the very high ferritin levels that we see in the DPMHD patients as well. What about uh, transferrin saturation or T-sets? Uh, T-sets, you know, look to be about um, steady over time here. And what about IV iron use? Uh, interestingly, if you see here, IV iron use in the PD population maybe, you know, went up slightly here in 2019, 
uh, dipped a little bit in January 2021, but has come back up again. Uh, but if you look in general, IV iron use, it's, you know, hovering somewhere a little bit above 60% of our PD population. And again, this is in stark contrast to the hemodialysis patients where you can see, um, you know, uh, well above 90% of patients are, are getting IV iron, although that trend has been um, coming down. In terms of IV iron prescription, so now the DPMPD, these um, are data that are restricted to the United States. It's really a deep dive into US data. This uh, chart here, uh, in contrast, is comparing uh, the US practice patterns in IV iron prescription to what we see in other countries in PDOPS, and that includes Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Japan, and the UK. And this is us here in the US in the far right here. Um, the N is down here in terms of the number of patients that we're talking, um, talking about. So you can see here that just in general, I mean, the US uses uh, any sort of iron in terms of IV or oral far more than any of the other countries. And IV iron use in particular is at least three times higher than any of the other um, countries. So um, definitely if you come to the US, um, much more likely to get any type of iron and certainly much more likely to get IV iron as a PD patient. Um, and let's take a look here at PD modality. Um, and so you can see here in the light blue um, is the percent of patients uh, in the PD population that are on CAPD. So that would be uh, patients getting manual exchanges versus the yellow, which is APD, automated PD, or those who are using a cycler. And so you can see here in the blue, again, it's pretty subtle. You know, there might be a some, somewhat of a trend going down that manual um, CAPD use has maybe been slightly trending down, but you know, not, not a huge difference. And here we're taking a look at total uh, prescribed volume um, of PD. And again, we're looking at APD, automated PD, or those on cyclers, versus CAPD, um, or continuous ambulatory PD, or those who are only doing manual exchanges. So you can see that um, in APD, the total daily volume here is 10 liters, and that's higher than what you see in CAPD, where the um, daily average volume prescribed is about seven and a half liters. Um, and that's likely a reflection of the fact that dwell times are going to um, be longer uh, with CAPD. Um, finally, if we take a look at agrodextrin prescriptions, um, in terms of agrodextrin use, it has gone up over this two-year period here, um, but it's still been consistently less than 10%. And again, this is in the US. Thank you so much for your attention, um, and uh, that will end my presentation. Hello, I'm Derek Forfang. I've been invited to give the patient's perspective. I appreciate that. I am a, um, I've had end-stage kidney disease for over 20 years. 12 of those years I was on dialysis and um, three of those dialysis years I was on peritoneal. I'd like to speak a little about kind of the push for patients to go on home dialysis starting with the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. This is a few years ago, and the target goal is 80% of new patients by 2025 either receiving dialysis at home or receiving a transplant. And there's various uh, um, uh, cost models that were put out there, like the treatment choice model that incentivizes getting home, uh, financial incentivizes getting home. And, um, you know, really focuses on kind of improving quality care for patients um, and some of the benefits we get from on home dialysis by, um, you know, not feeling washed out, not having to travel back and forth to a facility um, and those type of things that are great for patients as well as reducing the cost of care. There's other advantages and one I wanna talk about was through COVID-19. And uh, this was an article written by ProPublica, December of 2021, uh, titled They Were the pandemic's perfect victims talking about in-center dialysis patients. Um, and a couple of things I pulled out here that they touched on was one, 
disparities, um, disparities of, of Black and Hispanic patients not having the same um, access as, as white and Asian patients to dialysis. And they have some rates uh, there. I'll share some other rates in a minute. And then uh, talked also about you know, the fact that uh, home patients did better throughout the pandemic, uh, that when we went to the hospital less, we had less uh, uh, death rates, we had less infection rates. And uh, so it's a real benefit to being home during the last three years for the reason of the pandemic. Um, they also shared this chart, and it's uh, death spikes, really when COVID broke out in 2020. Um, although we've had spikes both in 21 and 22, uh, in 22, a, a real high infection rate, but luckily a less uh, of a death rate um, through COVID, but still benefits of, of being home rather than traveling back and forth uh, to dialysis. When we touch on disparities, the National Kidney Foundation, um, I pulled the statement out that they have showed that uh, uh, Asian and white patients have a nine, 10% respectively, and, and uh, for white only, and 6.1% of black patients that use PD. So we have a lot of room to do better and grow. Um, but we need to really focus on um, equalizing the opportunity to get on home. One of the things they touched on was bias of providers. And uh, they did a survey of 450 current uh, past ESRD patients. Uh, and Black respondents were much more likely than white respondents to say that their team did not provide educational information on dialysis treatment options. And they also felt more encouraged by their care team to try in-center dialysis. Um, so it, it shows there that we need to do a better job of giving all patients equal education on modalities. Uh, NKF continues their position that um, there are very few um, absolute clinical contradictions to home dialysis and that with the right empowerment and support, the majority of people um, can successfully use home. And I, I agree with that as well. Um, when we talk about patient uh, barriers to dialysis, uh, home dialysis modality, um, this was a response by patients from the National Forum of ESRD Networks Kidney Patient Advisory Council. And the patients wrote, uh, and this is a response, by the way, to the CMS RFI that was put out last year and talking about barriers and how to uh, overcome those barriers um, to make sure that we can uh, choose the, our treatment modality. And uh, what we talked about here, and I'll just summarize it, is um, a lot of patients crash in the hospital and emergency room um, with kidney failure. And unfortunately, it's, it's a little late by that time to get education on modalities um, and have those discussions. Many times we leave from the hospital with a catheter in our neck, and we go right to um, in-center dialysis. So we feel there needs to be a standard that all patients receive um, uh, materials about all modalities of, of dialysis and treatment from both home, to home, um, home hemo, PD, uh, transplant, as well as in-center. And we feel that probably it would be best for a third party to assure that all patients get um, that information without any bias. And so we feel that should be uh, mandated and, uh, and put into effect. So I talked a lot about uh, the incentives to get home, the money being spent, the effort, people power to get us there. But there's been little talk about on longevity of once you're home and you're on PD, how do you stay there? So I'd like to talk, talk a little about failure. And unfortunately, 40% of patients who start um, PD fail and go back to uh, home dialysis, usually in the facility um, within the first year, 70% within the first two years. So there's a really high failure rate. Infections were the leading cause of switching, uh, followed by other things like cardiovascular causes, uh, abdominal surgery, pancreatitis, malnutrition, um, 
mental capacity and wall defect, which are other things, but infection is an important one for certain. Um, there also is a challenge for diabetics looking at the dialysate being, uh, you know, using glucose uh, many times for myself being type one diabetic, I struggle to manage my blood sugars with the bags of a uh, glucose dialysate. And the more fluid I need to pull off, the higher glucose I dealt with, making it very difficult. Um, I used to pump. So I even called Baxter to find out the uh, carbs that were in a bag, uh, which they did not know. So I really struggled to keep my blood sugar well. And I think that was part of why I really failed on, um, on being on PD only after three years, along with the infections. So what do we need to do to improve? Um, there's several things we need to do before we even start. And one is to look at the patient's life. And this is for the, the nephrologist and the care team to talk to a patient. What does an average day look like? Um, do we work, go to school? Do we uh, have children? Do we take care of parents? Um, you know, what does our day look like? And without knowing that, it's very difficult to have a successful treatment, really need to tr build a treatment around a patient's life. So for instance, myself, I worked 10 to 12 hours a day, you know, had a very busy job. I had three young children. So by the time I was on the cycler all night, uh, went to work, got home, I only had a few hours to spend with my kids and then got ready, had to go to bed, get back on the cycler again. It was very difficult. Um, I struggled with some of the exchanges I had to do at work. I was very busy in and out of meetings and calls. So all of those things presented challenges for me that maybe we could have looked at the prescription and made some adjustments to make it better fit my life. So I think that's really important. I'm um, of course standardized training. Right now, some patients get help at home, some don't um, very initially and uh, training looks different. For me, it was just videos, trying it a couple times and then being sent home on my own. And then I mentioned uh, peritonitis and infection risk. Um, there's no transparency for patients. We don't really know. Do all patients get it? Do some patients get it? What are the rates? Um, it's not publicly shared it, to us. So we don't really understand the risk. And then there's no, uh, also no baseline to know how do we improve it? Is this working? Is education working? Are these infection rates going down over time? So really important. And then after start, we need more patient support. Um, there's burnout, stress, isolation, depression, and a lot of care partner burden um, gets put on the care partner. So possibly the use of routine hella te hella, uh, telehealth check-ins would improve things. Maybe even twice a month getting a call that talks to both the patient and the care partner about how things are going could find some of these challenges and frustrations both patients and care partners are having and to offer them help before it's too late. Um, I just wanted to make people aware there is a new bill. Uh, matter of fact, this week, we had uh, patients, donors, and family members on a virtual meetings up in Capitol Hill to talk to Congress, um, improving access to Home Dialysis Act, HR 5426. And this touches on a lot of things that I mentioned. So I hope you get a chance to look at this and support this for patients like myself. I wanna thank you for your time and, um, and thanks for the opportunity to share my uh, thoughts today. Hello, I'm, I'm Mark Lambay from the UK and I'm going to talk about the evidence underpinning icodextrin use. So I'm gonna talk about two particular areas. So I'm gonna talk about the physiology underpinning why agadextrin should be good and then I'm going to talk about the clinical evidence as to whether or not agadextrin actually does appear to be good. So talking first about the physiology. So agadextrin is mostly uh, relevant in relation to ultrafiltration and there's specific things we need to consider when thinking about ultrafiltration in peritoneal dialysis. So the first and obvious one that everybody will be familiar with I'm sure is the fast solute transfer rate. So that's where you get a more vascular membrane, you get more rapid reabs or absorption of the glucose. So you get more rapid loss of the osmotic pressure 
therefore you get less ultrafiltration with this faster solute transfer. Now, the, this is demonstrating the variability between patients in this fast solute transfer. So you can see that actually between patients at the start of PD, there is huge variability. So some patients clearly have a very vascular membrane where they'll get poor ultrafiltration at the start of PD and some patients have got far less vascularity and have got, will have much more sustained ultrafiltration with that. It's also worth pointing out that with time on average, the solid transfer rate will slowly drift up, but those differences over time aren't nearly as marked as the differences between people. Now, this is the uh, a figure demonstrating the ultrafiltration profiles you get with the different solutions. So the weak bags, medium bags, and strong bags. And you can see that um, the strong bags obviously are getting this sharp initial rise in ultrafiltration followed by a plateau and then you start to get reabsorption and it starts to tail off. Now for the slow solute transport rates, this spike will be higher, the plateau will be later and the reabsorption will occur later um, for whether it's the weak, medium or strong bags. There's a very different profile for the icodextrin though. And that is you don't get this initial sharp rise, you don't get a plateau, you don't get reabsorption, you just get slow, steady, sustained ultrafiltration with icodextrin. So it's clearly behaving in a very different way and it shouldn't be and isn't affected by solute transfer rate. That's because the increase in small pores that you're getting that cause the glucose reabsorption aren't leading to an increase in icodextrin reabsorption, so it's having no impact on the osmotic pressure. So fast solute transfer rates are an obvious situation where icodextrin could be beneficial along with short dwells, so in other words using automated peritoneal dialysis or the cycler. The other situation where icodextrin may have a significant advantage is based on some much more recent work, and this was um, Aquaporin work led by Johan Morel and Olivier de Voist. And what they've basically shown is that there are different genotypes or different polymorphisms in Aquaporin 1. And that one of these polymorphisms is associated with the reduction in Aquaporin expression. So that's this bit that's hidden by my picture of my camera here. Um, this reduction in Aquaporin expression is associated with less ultrafiltration being achieved and that's just demonstrating that it's having no impact at all on the solute transfer rate. Now the most compelling bit about this is the fact that the polymorphism that is associated with the reduction in ultrafiltration is associated with a significantly increased risk of um, death or transfer to hemodialysis. So it's almost certainly proving that an increase in free water clearance with this, um, with the aquaporin expression is associated with a better outcome. Now, the reason that that's relevant to aquaporins is because aquaporins are having their impact almost entirely across the small pores. So the expression of aquaporins will make no difference to the amount of ultrafiltration you get with icodextrin. So it would be very unlikely, based on our current understanding of the physiology, that icodextrin would be affected by this. So if you have a patient where you suspect that they could have this TT genotype for the aquaporins and therefore be having this worse ultrafiltration, that's nothing to do with solid transfer rates or glucose concentrations, then icodextrin should make uh, shouldn't be affected and it should still get good ultrafiltration. So it would be a solution to that problem. So that's just summarising those two statements. What I'm showing you is still all a little bit theoretical based on the physiology. What's the clinical evidence to support this? Well, it is one of the few areas in peritoneal dialysis where we actually have something approaching good evidence for a clinical intervention. So this is the Cochrane meta-analysis, and you can see that with icodextrin versus glucose for the long dwell, you're getting around about 450 mils of extra fluid ultrafiltrated. So really quite a substantial effect size there. 
There is another meta-analysis which does suggest that it, the, the principle that it should be particularly true in the fast solid transfer rate does appear to be borne out. And this increase in ultrafiltration is associated with a more meaningful clinic um, patient relevant outcome of a reduction in uncontrolled fluid overload episodes. And this effect estimate here is really quite large, it's 0.3. Now that was the um, Cochrane measure analysis. There's actually a more recent one where they managed to find a few extra trials that I think the, the companies had um, and they threw them into the meta-analysis pot and that reduced some of the uncertainty in the estimate for mortality. And enough so that they can now say that there is moderate quality evidence that agadextrin is associated with a substantial reduction in mortality. So the effect estimate here being 0.49, confidence intervals 0.24 up to 1. So most likely quite a significant effect, although there is still some uncertainty around that estimate and in fact it's, it's not quite as good a quality evidence as for the uncontrolled fluid overload but it's still quite a big effect size. Now what about agadextrin data in PDOPS? Well this is an analysis that's currently under in press I think actually now um, and just a quick reminder so PDOPS six countries by PD standards absolutely colossal study and lots of facilities and this is just the plot demonstrating the facility percentage of patients with agadextrin and the distribution of that within the country so um, the facility mean was 43 percent of their patients having agadextrin in australia and new zealand but you can see there is as i said there's some variability in that it, the, the Levels are not wildly dissimilar between Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Japan and the UK. The UK has possibly got more variability. But the one country where there does appear to be a more significant difference in prescribing patterns is the US, where 17% of the patients is the average number getting academic So there are quite substantial international differences in that practice pattern. Now, who's eicodextrin being used for? Well, you can see it's being used for patients who've been on PD for longer, who've got slightly more um, coronary disease, slightly worse residual renal function, substantially faster solute transfer, um, slightly worse albumins. So you can see that it is being targeted to patients who are at higher risk for adverse outcomes. So perhaps not surprisingly, actually, because it's there is this substantial indication bias if you look at the um, outcome of mortality and hemodialysis transfer, you can see that it is associated with worse outcome. Although when you adjust for most of these things, and particularly once you've included urinary volume, you can see that the um, it, it, it's consistent with no effect, but with some um, uncertainty around that estimate. Now, it is also worth bearing in mind this is just the measured confounders there may well be unmeasured confounders and in particular there may well be unmeasured confounding in relation to the aquaporin polymorphism as people didn't weren't able to measure that at the time so in terms of the agadextrin results within pdops then we can say that there are significant national and facility differences in agadextrin use and the usa in particular uses less agadextrin and actually has a higher substantially higher glucose usage because of that it is being targeted to worst membranes and optical, um, and possibly because of that, it was not associated with lower mortality in hemodialysis transfer. So in summary, we can say that Icodexin would be a good solution to increase solute transfer. It would be a good solution to reduce aquaporin expression. And in that one in particular, we don't have other good strategies to deal with that problem. The clinical evidence does appear to back this up. It increases UF compared with glucose for the long dwell. It reduces episodes of uncontrolled fluid overload. There is now evidence that mortality may well be reduced. And agadexin use in the US is a relatively small fraction of the use in other developed countries. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Pearl, and it's a pleasure to present to you some highlights from our Optimizing the Prevention of Peritoneal Dialysis Associated Peritonitis in the United States Study, or OPUS. And I just want to thank all of our OPUS investigator team um, for working on this OPUS project. And it's been a real honor to work with everybody. And I just want to remind everybody that this is funded from a grant from the AHRQ. And we all know that peritonitis is really important. And so this was the standardizing outcomes in nephrology group initiative that got together a group of kidney patients, uh, kidney care community members, including allied health and physicians. And as you can see, when they ranked the core outcomes that are of importance to individuals, peritonitis was one of the top outcomes. So this is something that's very important in terms of an event to try to prevent, to try to better understand for the PD community. And so with that in mind, we developed OPUS with our study aims to standardize the definition of peritonitis and achieve national reporting of PD peritonitis, at least that's the goal in the future, to characterize the variability in peritonitis rates, microbiology and outcomes across US facilities and compared to the world, to identify PD and patient facility characteristics that impact the risk as well as clinical practices and training and education program characteristics with the ultimate goal to standardize the definition of peritonitis and develop evidence-based best practices. So when we think about interventions to prevent peritonitis, ones that are important are before patients start PD, in the transition to PD, and after PDs are already been initiated. And before patients start PD, it's really important to look at the patient characteristics that impact the risk of peritonitis. And this is Canadian data from a large multi-center Canadian database that showed that in this study, Black patients had a 37% increased risk of peritonitis in patients receiving PD over this period of time, 1996 to 2005. More recent data done by our group using US RDS claims data shows also a higher risk of peritonitis um, in Black patients over time uh, and a more, in a more contemporary cohort compared to the previous study between 2013 to 17. Across all groups, peritonitis rates are improving, but rates are still higher for Black patients receiving PD. And the big question is, how do we address this disparity in terms of outcomes? And it's really important for us to really focus on strategies to improve peritonitis, but also to focus on particular patient groups that may be particularly vulnerable. And I think this is a call to action to the PD community at large to really try to address this. So I'm really happy to see a bill being proposed, the Improving Access to Home Dialysis Act, which is a bill being proposed to, pro to provide in-home assistance in the early period on PD, to build in respite, to build in uh, support for educational opportunities and training. And I'm really hoping that this not only narrows the gap in terms of underutilization of PD among minority groups, but also in terms of improving outcomes for patients receiving PD who belong to these minority groups, including reducing risks of peritonitis. And it'll be exciting to see as this bill hopefully comes to fruition, if that does translate into a reduction in the risk of peritonitis. In the transition to PD, it's really important to think about strategies to prevent peritonitis at the time of catheter insertion. And in the US, I'm disappointed to say that when we surveyed medical directors, only 63% of medical directors followed a grade 1A ISPD recommendation, which was antibiotics at the time of catheter insertion. So we really need to better understand how to improve knowledge translation among best practices to medical directors and PD physicians at large across the US, because this number should really be 100%. And so this is really a call to action to improve the way in which we disseminate best practices across, um, across the uh, kidney care community in the United States. One factor that's really important is patient training. And there's a huge variability in our international PDOP study in the number of hours that patients are trained for PD, huge variability within countries and between countries. And when we looked at the impact of training factors, the number of days, the number of training hours, we really didn't see a big strong signal in this publication in terms of training hours or time or location really impacting the risk of peritonitis. So I don't think that this means that training characteristics aren't important, 
but we really don't know what it is about training patients for PD that really mac it maximizes them for success to lead to a reduction in the risk of peritonitis. So in Australia, they're doing a randomized control trial called the Teach PD study, really randomizing patients to a standardized curriculum for training and facilities. Uh, the randomization is at the facility level. So some facilities will have uh, their usual training practices. Others will be involved in others will be involved in this standardized education curriculum, and the uh, outcome of that study will be time to first PD infection. And it'll be interesting to see which, which this study is already underway, the results of which, and whether a standardized curriculum does reduce the risk of peritonitis. We also know another ISPD recommendation is exit site prophylaxis at the time of uh, exit site antimicrobial prophylaxis to be applied as a topical antimicrobial ointment or cream with routine daily PD catheter exit site care. And in the US here, most patients are using an aminoglycoside, and that's probably because of the evidence generation in the US about the uh, superiority of exit site aminoglycoside over mupiracin in the reduction in the risk of peritonitis. However, there is some quite good data with mupiracin as well, and the ISPD recommends either mupiracin or an aminoglycoside, and you can see that variability across PDOPS countries. And in Canada, for example, mupiracin seems to be a more predominant strategy. We know that low potassium previously impacted the risk of peritonitis. When we look at low potassium in our PD patient cohort in PDOPS, there isn't as strong a risk with peritonitis as we previously have seen in other studies. And when you adjust for different patient characteristics, it seems to attenuate the risk of low potassium on touch or skin bug organism peritonitis or culture negative or bowel bug peritonitis. And previous studies particularly said that low potassium might impair gut motility, specifically increasing the risk here, but we saw no such effect. Now, I still think that we should be replacing low potassium and perhaps low potassium might be a marker for other nutritional or comorbid factors that increase the risk of peritonitis, but at least we don't see an, a, as strong a signal as in previous studies with its impact on peritonitis risk. Antifungal prophylaxis using either nystatin or another antifungal over the course of antibiotic treatment for patients on PD might reduce the risk of antibiotic associated fungal peritonitis. And here's some studies to demonstrate that. And the most commonly used is nystatin, 500,000 units QID for the duration of antibiotics and plus one week uh, past the use of antibiotics. And when we surveyed medical directors across PDOPS countries, 46% of medical directors in the U.S. still are not using antifungal prophylaxis for antibiotic courses, despite it being an ISPD guideline endorsement, much higher in Australia. And I think that that speaks to their significant knowledge translation strategy, where they really noticed a very high peritonitis rate and had a call to action through a, through a nationwide knowledge translation initiative to reduce peritonitis. And as you can see, it did result in better uptake of evidence-based practices. In our pediatric patients as well, there are bundles of evidence-based care that clinics decided to take up as part of the SCOPE collaborative. And I think our pediatric colleagues should be commended because when you follow clinics along that participated in, this, in the initiative before, the peritonitis rates were quite high. Once clinics got together, they implemented evidence-based practices and they were surveillanced as part of the SCOPE collaborative, the peritonitis rate went down. So participating in a collaborative, documenting peritonitis rates and systematic implementation of best practices in our pediatric uh, colleagues' clinics did result in a reduction in the risk of peritonitis. And this is something we should certainly look to um, in the adult PD clinics to try to recapitulate. As a first step in OPIS, we're actually recording peritonitis episodes systematically across 60 sites in the U.S., and I want to thank Northwest Kidney Centers, DaVita, U.S. Renal Care, uh, as well as the independent clinics that are participating in the study um, and are providing this important information. But in our one-year pilot, it is feasible to collect information on peritonitis. And this is just our preliminary data. We've had many more episodes of peritonitis collected to date. But what we've learned is that culture negative peritonitis is a much bigger problem than we previously thought. And it, it occupies a sizable number 
of episodes of peritonitis. And we need to better understand why we're seeing a higher incidence of culture negative peritonitis than would be suggested we should target according to ISPD guidelines, which suggests that less than 10% should be due to that. So that's really an important thing to think about. And if we want to improve peritonitis related transfers to hemo, we have to talk about implementing strategies that I just mentioned to reduce peritonitis incidence, but also make sure that we successfully treat peritonitis as well. So it's a, it's a combination of reducing peritonitis incidence and improving cure rates. And even though peritonitis rates might be improving over time, peritonitis is still the leading cause of transition to hemodialysis in the United States among all causes and across the world. So reducing the risk of peritonitis leading to catheter removal and transition to hemodialysis is really important. And what is that risk? When we looked at that risk across PDOPS countries, and I just want to focus your attention to the United States, you can see here that the United States actually has about a risk of about 15% uh, of every peritonitis episode, of all peritonitis episodes leads to transition to hemodialysis. So one in five peritonitis episodes lead to a transition to hemodialysis across the United States. And so the question is, what can we do to improve treatment of peritonitis, med successful medical treatment, and reduce those risks. And when you look across the globe, that 15% is pretty comparable, 15 to 20% across consistently across countries participating in the PDOC. So is it all, um, you know, when we wanna think about improving outcomes related to peritonitis, we wanna think about um, not only successfully preventing peritonitis, but also successfully treating it. If we think about which peritonitis episodes are most likely to lead to catheter removal in adverse events, we need to develop targeted strategies based on those high-risk episodes. One feature of peritonitis that increases or decreases the risk of an adverse outcome is the type of organism. And when we looked in our PDOPS OPUS study, when you look at gram-positive as the reference group, gram-negative bugs uh, tend to have a much higher risk of death, hemodialysis transfer, and catheter removal. So even though they may be less uh, in, in frequency, a greater proportion leads to adverse outcomes. Same thing with culture negative. We saw an increased risk of death with culture negative peritonitis, a trend to an increased risk of hemodialysis transfer. And so one of the factors is how do we reduce culture negative peritonitis? In this initiative in Thailand, what they did is they actually implemented an evidence-based strategy where they sent samples from local labs to a central lab that followed ISPD guidelines and compared their results to a local lab. And there were 28% of organisms that didn't grow in local labs that ended up growing in the central labs, which suggests a quality improvement initiative to improve culture negative peritonitis by optimizing culture techniques really is needed across clinics in Thailand. And I think something similar should be done here in the United States. Well, how we treat peritonitis might also impact outcomes. So when we look at the treatment of gram-negative peritonitis, clinics that used aminoglycosides or ciprofloxacin tended to have a lower, uh, uh, a higher cure rate compared to clinics that used ceftazidine. Is this differences in resistance patterns, which we couldn't tell in the present study? Is it that these, uh, the pharmacokinetics of these antibiotics were perhaps better in terms of uh, being consistent and reliable compared to cephalosporins, and that resulted in better cure rates is really not known and needs to be tested in future prospective studies. So I hope I gave you some uh, very quick food for thought on strategies to prevent and treat peritonitis really using the data and findings from the OPUS study as a backbone to do so, and be happy to take questions. At this point, we're just going to quickly show the poll results in the interest of time. Um, so let's take a look here. All right, good. So that is the correct answer. There, the uh, All of the our, uh, ISPD recommendations, the 69% consecutive training, is not an ISPD uh, recommendation. So that's really great. Um, but still for the 15%, 8% that answer the other questions, um, we still have some in increased knowledge translation to work on. So 43% said none. And then of those that identified barriers to icodextrin, 
use, the, the number one barrier was other. So we've got to try and figure out what that other is. Be interested in the chat if people would comment on that. Uh, but unfamiliarity with prescribing, uh, 23% and paperwork, 20%. So I think we can work on physician, I think we can work on unfamiliarity with prescribing through education um, and some discussion on that, but really interesting. I don't know, Jenny, if you want to provide your thoughts on, on some of this from your perspective, being a nephrologist in the U.S., and then I think we'll have to close the session shortly thereafter. Yeah, certainly. I've talked to some other uh, U.S. nephrologists. I think there are some people who, um, like myself, uh, work with different pairs and uh, I have had a lot of hurdles in terms of paperwork to show that there is a need to use echodextrin but there are other people I think that are in integrated healthcare systems where it hasn't been an issue. Right so that's that's an important insight and I think we'll just quickly close this there the session the webinar with the with a perspective from Derek and Derek thank you so much we always want to hear from the patient and definitely want to close with hearing from the patient are we going to get to 80%? What do you think? Yes, no, and what's the single biggest factor that's going to get us there if if we do? Well, you know, I think it's a <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I think it it'll, it'll save lives, especially during COVID. I think we have an opportunity with COVID rates being down this summer to get more patients home. I think it'll be safer for us. Um but I, I think it's a challenge. I, I don't know if we can achieve that. Uh, looking at the last couple of years of what we've been able to improve, which hasn't gone up much at all. So I, I think we need to change our the way we communicate with patients. We need to uh, uh, make sure that all patients are aware of the opportunities to go home and uh, maybe have some more patient stories shared of successes so patients aren't so fearful of going home. I think uh, Sometimes the talk about infection scares patients away um, because we really don't know, you know, if uh, yeah. uh, we all get infections or not. So I think uh, there needs to be some work done there so we can uh, uh, assess the risk and look at the benefits and make the right choice. But uh, if it's not presented, presented correctly, uh, um, I don't think you're going to convince people to do it. So education and support. We're going back to basic principles. And we're still back to where we have been over the last several years. Need to improve those pathways. Thanks, Derek. And I want to thank all the panelists and speakers for an excellent webinar. There will be a recording available. And I want to thank you, the attendees, for your time and attention. And as always, feel free to reach out to us and the DOPS team after the webinar if you have any questions or comments. Thank you so much and be well.